So I'm here with Dr. Naomi Oreskes, who has agreed to meet with me very kindly here at University of California, San Diego. And Dr. Oreskes, uh, what has happened in the world since your publishing of the 2004 uh, article, uh, Beyond the Ivory Tower, the Scientific Consensus on Climate Change in the journal Science? Mm -hmm. uh, how has public uh, views of global climate change changed since then? Mm -hmm. Well, I think what's happened in the world is disappointing and frustrating that we really have not made a lot of substantial progress in cutting CO2 emissions, and I think it's a real problem. So not much positive outcome well, from that? Well, yeah, I think so. I mean, if you look at, say, the Copenhagen, the COP15 meeting in Copenhagen a few months ago, and there was a lot of talk, but no binding agreement came out of that meeting, and here it is, you know. And this, is the, this group has been trying to come to agreements since 1992, since the original UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in Rio, the Earth Summit in 1992. So we've had a lot of time to work on this, and this is the 15th meeting, COP15, and yet we still seem to be unable to come to a meaningful agreement to actually do something about global warming, even though we know, we know it's happening, we see it all around, but we still somehow can't seem to do anything about it. Okay, and part of this may be because uh, even though you've shown that there is a clear consensus in the scientific community, a lot of people still believe there is a debate out there. Uh, why is this, and, and what do you think some of the motiva motivations behind uh, the fabrications of this confusion right. Well, are? people think there's a debate out there because that's what they've been repeatedly told. And we know where the source of this is, and this is the topic of my new book, which I can advertise right Excellent. here, Merchants of Doubt, which will be published by Bloomsbury Press. What my co-author and I, Eric Conway, have shown in this book is we've tracked the various doubt-mongering campaigns that have been going on really since the 1980s over a set of environmental issues of which global warming is the biggest and most important, but not by any means the only one. Acid rain, the ozone hole, secondhand smoke, TDT. And what we know from this research is that there's been a concerted, organized, and very systematic effort to confuse people on these issues mm -hmm. by insisting that the science was unsettled long after it really was. And you know, Canadians in particular were the victims of this with respect to acid rain because long after the scientific community had concluded that acid rain was real, that it was harming Canadian and American forest fish uh, and other wildlife, that fish were going extinct in some areas, uh, that the forests were being damaged. This science was well established and it was clear that, the result, that it was the result of acidic emissions primarily from power plants in the industrial Midwest of the United States, also to some extent Canada smelters like around the Sudbury mm -hmm. mines in Ontario. Um, well, I mean, it took another decade, more than another decade, before we got meaningful controls on acid rain emissions. And the motivation was to prevent regulation by interested parties who um, were going to be affected by those regulations. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have evidence on a lot of these big issues, climate change included. How can the work of reputable scientists be better communicated to the public? Right. Well, that's a really important point, because one of the, books, one of the questions we ask in this book is, well, you know, how did these people get away with this for so long, and why didn't anybody speak up, why didn't people speak out about it? And I think one of the reasons is that the scientific community hasn't really stepped up to the plate and hasn't really addressed many of these things head on, because a lot of scientists don't really feel it's their role. They feel it's their job to do the science, publish it in peer-reviewed journals. And that's their job, and it's somebody else's job to worry about communicating it to the public. And I'm certainly sympathetic with that. I certainly understand that scientists are scientists. They want to do science, and that's what they're trained to do. But it leaves a big gap. It leaves a big gap for who is going to be the one to communicate it to the public. And if scientists don't communicate it, then it leaves a big vacuum where other people um, who may have other interests can step in and say, oh, well, we don't really know. We're not really sure what causes acid rain. We don't really know if there's really an ozone hole. And so I think the scientific community need has, needs to do much, much more. And, I think and they need to take seriously that their job is not just doing the science, but also communicating. Otherwise, it's like the proverbial tree falling in the forest. Great science, but nobody, nobody hears. Because the public doesn't really know where to go for this information. They don't. That's right.